And so I'm just going to start this morning by saying exactly what the Lord said to me this morning. <laughs> you know, I don't know. A lot of people think that in order for God to speak to you or give you a revelation, you know, you have to be on your knees or you have to mm-hmm. be standing with your hands raised or you have to be in some religious position, you know, a traditional position mm-hmm. of um, to to hear from God. So, um, So this morning, I heard the voice of God loud and clear. And he said, as I was cooking my eggs, get this settled. I went, yes, sir. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about this man-woman thing. And I'm talking about the teaching of Paul that has been so misunderstood and i had i I had been (laughs) i told you this last time i've been attempting to not want to continue with timothy not want to continue with the things that um and you know come up with something a a different uh, message and i had one last night that was meditating on when i went to bed and (laughs) and i got up this morning and no matter what I did during the week as I was studying and reading the Word. I kept popping over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 on the headship issue. Does everybody know what I'm talking about when I say headship issue? This has been a big deal in the church for ever. Well, at least as long as I'm going to put, it may not have been in the Middle Ages. It may not have been, you know, but it, it has been in my lifetime. And I wanted to stay away from it. I didn't want to get into it, just like I didn't want to get into 1 Timothy chapter 2, where it said women keep silence in the church. Mm -hmm. It's not my position, in my opinion, to do that. Some man needs to rise up and say what's right, but nobody has (laughs) recently. And so um, the Lord gave me that. And popping over to from 1 Timothy chapter 2, where it says, why don't we just go ahead and read that again? I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I'll be glad to do this if you'll just explain it to me. <laughs> you know, I'm sure that Noah, when he, God said, go out and build an ark, um, he didn't have any comprehension of rain, you know, and yet acting and stepping out in faith and being willing to do what God tells you to do then brings revelation. Did you hear me on that? That was that was a word from the Lord there. Sometimes you're in a situation where you don't know what to do. You don't know what the answer is. And running it around in your head going, what am I going to do? What am I going to do if I do this? What if I do that? How many of you know that doesn't work? It does not. It does not work. It's only by revelation of the Spirit. But revelation of the Spirit only comes as you take that step in faith. And so I said, okay. Okay, Lord. So anyway, we've been we were in First Timothy two, and he says uh, the 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 verse in question was verse eleven. Let a woman, <laughs> I don't know what the King King James says. Let women keep silence in the church. Let women keep silence. I'm reading now the ESV, which is better. Let a woman learn quiet quietly, but. For a long time, the only version of the Bible was the King James, right? Mm-hmm. And so one thing I've learned is I've studied the Greek, I study Hebrew, and I am not a he- Greek scholar, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but thank God, today we have ways here on this iPad that I can flip over and look at the Greek and the Hebrew words, and I can not have to rely on somebody else to tell me what God meant or what Paul meant, right? I can... I can question that and any religion that says don't question anything is usurping your authority hello hello usurping your authority so i can look at this and read it and ask questions god doesn't mind if you ask questions and so for years i asked questions about this many people ask questions about it many people just swallowed it 
well, women are not supposed to speak in church. Women are not supposed to teach the Bible. That's been for years, all right? And it says, let a woman learn quietly. And this is good. The ESV has it right. Let her learn quietly with all, it says submissiveness. And there's another bad word, okay? But it means in subjection. What it means is, as I studied the Greek, and I know I'm going over some of the things I said before, but I've learned, and I told Brienne the other day, one, I have really missed it, and one of my shortcomings is not repeating, and that's the only way we get it. So that word means when you're sitting here right now, you're all subjecting yourself and listening to what I'm saying, mm -hmm. okay? If you weren't, you'd be jumping up going, ah! You know, that's that's not learning in subjection. That's not learning in subjection. So obviously something was going on in this particular church. It was problematic. And we talked, was it January? What date was it? 22nd, the week of the 22nd. And I taught on goddesses, cults, and women preachers. And I talked about what was going on at the church at Ephesus. And I'm not going to completely go back over that, but it was a, a goddess-oriented society, which meant that if they thought that the Amazons, the large women warriors, were the ones that founded the city, and thereby now we have the, the, um, the goddess in the city that they worked, which was Diana or Artemis, called Artemis there, and so they worshipped her, and so this was a a female-led spiritual um, culture. And so, I told you I felt sorry for Timothy. This is where Paul left him in the middle of this. <laughs> and so you can just imagine Timothy up there. You can kind of get the feel of his personality as you read what Paul says to him. You can imagine him left in the middle of a, a lot of um, uh, women who had been involved in this worship, who were used to being in charge, okay, being in charge. And so him up teaching, well, wait a minute, when we worshiped Artemis, it was this way. You know, that's that's interruption. That's not learning in subjection. Everybody said, mm -hmm. amen, that's not learning in subjection. So we have the let women keep silence in the church in the King James, as I recall. I just I don't read the King James that much. But this says, let a woman learn quietly or with quietness. And then he says, I do not permit a woman to teach. And they stop there. How many of you heard that quoted? There's a certain denomination that will not ordain women because it says, let the women be quiet in the church. And Paul said, I don't let them teach. That wasn't the whole sentence. Read the whole sentence. Right. Yeah. I do not allow a woman to teach or usurp authority over a man. And I told you what the word usurp there, first of all, I've got to go back a ways. Um, I wanted to give you the whole thing, but I'm just going to give you the my remembrance of what it said. The very first, I know what it said, because when I looked up the word exercise authority, I don't know what I was expecting, but it wasn't the definition of killing somebody. It meant homicide or suicide. To usurp authority. It is not the word, it's not what we're talking about. To usurp authority mm -hmm. means, let's, let's put it on, it didn't really mean people in the church were, I meant women were killing men in the church, I don't think. Maybe it was. <laughs> But what it meant was when one person comes to another and takes away their choice and takes over their life, that's usurping authority. And that can happen whether you're male or female. It can happen at home. It can happen at school. It can happen in work where someone says, you don't have a right to believe this. This is what's right. This is what you have to do. This is the way it is. That's what you call an autocrat, right? It's a person that just comes in and says, I know, and this is the way it is, okay? And that is, that's not the way we are to relate to each other at all. 
And I never knew, I have never known Paul to preach divisiveness. Do you find that in there? He's not preaching divisiveness. So what in the world does all this stuff say? So we've decided in the King James in the past, how many every years here in the church that women can't speak in the church. But then let's pop over to um, 1 Corinthians 11. And verse 5, does somebody have something besides the ESV here? The ESV is just too good. I'm trying to make a point. <laughs> I've got the King James. Okay, read the King James for me. Just verse 5? Just verse 5. But every woman that prayeth or prop prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. Okay, every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. Well, the same denomination that says women can't teach in the church believes, does not believe that prophesying is an inspired um, uh, spoken prophecy by the Spirit because they no longer believe in the gifts of the Spirit. And their definition of prophecy is, is inspired preaching or teaching. I'm going to let that sit on you a minute. And yet Paul says, the woman who prays or prophesies in the church. So these, these, how can you pray or prophesy in the church and be quiet? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Or I should say silent. How can you be silent and not pray or prophesy and pray or prophesy? I mean, you, there, there's two different things. If I'm praying and prophesying, you're hearing what I'm doing, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not sorry. So was Paul um, schizophrenic? Was he mixed up? No. No, he wasn't. So these must have been specific instructions for specific churches. Specific instructions for specific churches. So I just want to bring that out. Now let's back up to verse verse 1 of this chapter. And Paul says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Is it fair to say that if Paul's not imitating Christ, we shouldn't imitate him? No amens, but well, yeah. Okay, follow me as I follow God. If I go off after another idol or something, don't follow me, right? Okay, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now, he says, I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. Does everybody know what traditions are? They're not necessarily something in the Bible that God has instructed, but it's just a traditional type of thing. Um, the Greek says, the body that traditions are the body of precepts, especially rituals that were orally transmitted in unbroken succession to subsequent generations. And this is talking about Jewish traditionary law. In other words, he says, just as I narrated to you what the traditions are. Everybody say traditions. Everybody say rituals. Okay, just hold on. We're going to get out of this okay. Maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand. And here's where we get into a lot of fun. So buckle your seat belts. I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a woman is the man. I'm, trying, I'm going trying to go back to the um, King James again. And the head... Okay, everybody can, <laughs> got it? Got it. I, I'm supposing that wasn't a tornado warning. Okay, all right. So, he says, the head of the man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. 
everybody here from the United States of America or the Western world, right? We're all from the Western world. So when we use the word head, we use it a little differently probably than maybe Paul meant it right here. And um, I'm going to drag this over. Try not to miss. Okay, this is traditional thought. Okay, we've got God, Christ, man, woman. And so when we do this, we do this vertically because God is above all, right? And so we think in a linear manner that when we're talking about headship, that this is how it works. And so what Western civilization has centered up in is this part right here. And over the years, we've seen great suppression in the body of Christ of at least 50% of the body of Christ. Would you agree that women make up at least 50% of the body of Christ? Probably more, but we'll just say 50%. Yeah. And so this belief that women can't do a lot of things, then that um would you say that hinders the body of Christ? Yeah. Would you say that if you are if you had no arms or legs, it would hinder your yeah. function? Are women part of the body of Christ? Yeah. Are men part of the body of Christ? Yes. Do we need both? Yes. Yes. But we don't need them in this fight right here. We don't need them in the, in this sort of thing. Mm -mm. And this is what's happened. Well, the man, this, the woman, this, the da 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 And Paul, when we get to heaven, I'm going to have a talk with him and ask him <laughs> some things. And I want to know exactly, because I, I'm pulling together history and culture here and finding out on stuff like Artemis about the Amazons, about what the idea was, why he wrote the church at Ephesus the way he did. And I want to know what was going on in Corinth, all right? But it's very clear that we need to ask the question. I can't tell you exactly until I have a conversation with Paul. But what we can do is eliminate what it is not, right? Okay, so let's start out with what does the word head mean? What is the word head? Okay. Everybody do this. Physical head <laughs> goes from here, here, all the way around. This is my physical head from the neck up, right? Right. That's physical head. All right. The the, the Greek word is kephale, K-E-P-H-A-L-E, -E, all right? And then we have another use of the word head today in this society, and it's the head of the line. Everybody want to be the head of the line? I want to be the first for the pizza or the cake or go to the head of the line. Yes. Okay. Gary always goes to the head of the line. It's because you send me. I do. <laughs> I do because I know he wants to go. I know he wants to go, so I just send him and he obeys his wife. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> So we can go to the head of the line. Jesus said the first will be last and the last will be first. Well, I, you know, whatever. But you can go to the the head of the line and that's a, that's that we use that word, don't we? Okay? And then there's a head of an organization. The the uh CEO or whatever of a company, there's a head of the organization. And then there is a tribal headship. That is a result when you get into, as we talked before, in Jewish history, there's the firstborn. Has everybody, anybody ever noticed that the firstborn is mentioned lots of times in the Bible? Why? Because it is a headship of a tribe. Jacob had 12 sons. 
And those 12 sons then produced more children. And the firstborn was automatically put in as the head because of being the oldest. It's called birth order. And Brianne's done a lot of studying on birth order, and she knows that there are some uh, specific psychological differences and um, things in the, the firstborn. And it just happens that way. But you also see in the Bible that there are times that the firstborn blew it big time. I mean, look at David and Solomon. Solomon wasn't born first, but look at what happened to his other children. So therefore, there is a difference, okay? So we talk about tribal headship, born first, and in a way, in a, the Western society, we still honor that. And that we honor our elders, don't we? Mm -hmm. Somebody say amen. We honor those who have come before. We honor, our, the Bible tells us to honor our parents and we'll live long on the earth. Well, the parents came before the children. We honor our parents. We honor our grandparents. And in the assembly, which Paul talked about with Timothy, he talked about honoring the elders and approaching an elder man as you would your father or grandfather. In other words, with honor and approaching them in that way. So in that way, we talk about our elders. That is some semblance of a tribal headship in a way. And then we talk about getting ahead in a race or getting ahead financially. So if you're ahead in a race, what position do you have? First. Number one, okay? But that just gives you the number one position in that race. It doesn't give you a number one position down here at the bank. It doesn't give you a number one position at Baskin Robbins. Mm -hmm. You know, they used to have little things you'd pull a number to get weighted on. I was so glad when they did away with that. <laughs> Because I could just run through the door and be first, <laughs> right? Yeah. But being first at Baskin Robbins doesn't mean I'm first at the bank. It doesn't mean that I'm first in the right. It doesn't mean it's all relevant, right? Okay. So then, and this kind of goes back to Hebrew in a way. There is the word for head also can mean the head of a river. Has anybody ever heard somebody say, well, that's the head of the Colorado River. Ever heard that? Well, it, it's not this kind of head, is it? Mm -hmm. it's, it? It's not a head in a race, is it? Okay, so in that instance, what does it mean? It means source or origin. This is the source of this river. This is the source or the origin of of the river as the waters come down from the Rocky Mountains and run to the bottom and it cuts a, it cuts a deep chasm through there and starts running. It's a river. And the source of that river is the water that comes down from that mountain that creates those, those chasms that becomes a river. So from what I can tell, and I'm going to continue through the scriptures here quickly, from what I can tell, this may is a very heavy meaning in the scriptures as source or origin. So let's do something different here so you can just be thinking about it. <clears throat> Am I still on the screen? And I'm writing really small. For those of you watching by YouTube, this says God, Christ, man, woman, and this says God, Christ, man, woman. All right, so if we're going to interpret headship as meaning the boss over, the ruler over, then we have to ask some questions about this, okay? Because Paul said this, let's read it again. The head of every man is Christ. The head of a woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So let me ask you this. We have to ask this question. If we can put all that junk away that we've been told for the last how many ever years of your life, we have to ask about, this is about relationship, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So 
we have to ask this question. If we're going to interpret this as the boss or the ruler, we have to ask about this relationship here. Now, you notice that Paul said the head of Christ is God. So, if the word means Christ, and we've put Christ Jesus together, we have to ask, what's the difference in the words Christ and Christ Jesus? Well, Jesus was born of a woman, right? Mary. He was conceived by Mary. He was God was his father, but he was conceived by Mary. So the, the man Jesus was human form. Everybody say amen. 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 <laughs> he came in the flesh. So what does this what does this mean by Christ? Christ. Christ is the anointed. Christ is the Messiah. But Christ it when you use these two words, you're not saying the same thing, even though we combine them. Christ Jesus, the anointed Messiah, Yeshua Hamashiach. Okay, so the anointed, but Christ was the Word, is the Word, and the Word of God, Christ Himself, was eternally preexistent as part of the Trinity. Isn't that right? Jesus in human form was not part of the Trinity. His human body came when Christ came to earth and incarnated in human form. Are you following me so far? So let's talk again. Who was Jesus? Jesus was the man. Handle me. A spirit has not flesh and bone as you see me have. He's physical. He has a physical body. He came to the earth, was born of a woman. The physicality, Jesus' human form, Christ. We would liken this as to everybody say, I have a body. I have a body. <clears throat> clap your hands. If you clap your hands and no sound came out, we know you're not really here. <laughs> a spirit. Do you hear when the angels are worshiping God? I mean, you know, but you might have that opening sometime, but that's in the realm of the Spirit. So we have the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit that have existed eternally from the beginning, and in that form he was Christ, and he appeared occasionally in the Old Testament, and we call it a theophany where he appeared, but he didn't take on himself human flesh until Mary conceived in her spirit. So we've got two things. God manifested in the flesh. Everybody say, God manifests in the flesh. Jesus was, I mean, Christ, Christ is God, and he manifests in human form. So grasp the fact that Christ the anointed, Christ the Son, the third, about the Trinity here, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Father, Son, Christ, and Holy Spirit, but Jesus was the man. It's, he has a human name. Jesus was the man. Okay, so let's go back to the relationship between God as the, as the head of Christ. So is God the boss of Christ? Does God rule Christ? Does God tell him what to do? And if there is a trinity to hear, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, why would God be telling himself what to do? I'd love to just ask questions and leave it with you. You figure it out. All right. However, in human form, God communicated with Jesus, the incarnate Christ, and he had to communicate with him in this human form. So are, are you clear on this? Mm -hmm. Jesus, the man, was Christ, but he was Christ in the flesh, 
He was God incarnate in the flesh. And so let me ask, are God and Christ in harmony and in unity and in agreement? Yes. So I want to ask you the question. Oh, also, okay, let's take another thing here. The head of the river, the source or origin. So if the point is that Paul's making was this, that, well, God is the source of Christ, and Christ is the source of man, and man is the source of woman. If God's ma- if, if Paul's making that, that statement, then we have to ask, did God create himself? <laughs> Are you sorry to see? We got to get past some really big things here to say that Paul's talking about headship as a rulership, tribal, whatever. We got some big things to get over here because God didn't create Christ. It says he, Christ, was eternally present with God in the beginning. All things were created by him. Who? The word. Who is the word? Christ. All things were created by him, and through him were all things made that were made. Are you more confused now than ever? (laughs) I just want to shake your head up. I want to shake your head up because I've been on this for a while. I'm going, God, just, okay, so what was going on here? So what was Paul's point? What was his point? The point was, is that God and Christ are in unity. Man and woman should be in unity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. His point was unity. And the devil took it and made it divisive. The point is unity. Now, God the creator. Okay, we got to read some more here. I'm I'm getting this as good as I can. I'm probably going to have to come back and do it again (laughs) next week, right? Okay. I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. The head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. What in the world does that mean? Well, let me just say very quickly, and I can go into this in depth because I've studied it. But every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. He dishonors, who's his head? Christ. So what was Paul thinking? Okay, so we're talking about a church in Corinth. We're talking about Greek, Romans, barbarians, a whole bunch of different people. So evidently, if you look at pictures, hand me my Bible, honey. If you look at pictures of Roman men, when they are in religious I, I don't, you may not, you probably can't see this, but I'm going to describe it. This is my archaeology Bible. Here is a picture right here of Augustus Caesar with a head covering at Corinth. And you can see he has a robe and he has his head covered. Men like Augustus Caesar in this particular instance covered their head when praying or in a religious spiritual situation in order to show that they honored the gods, that they were submissive to the gods. What gods am I talking about? Yahweh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? No, Augustus Caesar would worship Zeus, Apollo, the those gods, other gods. And so he says, Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors Christ because somebody walks in your midst and there's a man that's covered his head and is prophesying. And they think that it is a result of the, the mythological gods that they worshiped, Apollo or Zeus or one of those. Can you get this? Let's bring it down to Oklahoma. So. Let's say that 
and you know this to be true, that gangs have certain colors and things that they wear. Everybody knows, woo, that's that gang, that's the Crips, that's the this, that's the that. Everybody knows that it's the gang, okay? And let's say it's a, a beanie or a skull cap or something that everybody wears, right? So if we're in here and somebody walks in here in the church service and they have that on showing, I'm a gang member, are they honoring Christ? Everybody's going to be quiet, (laughs) staring, because they're saying, I serve this gang. So in the church at Corinth, if the man covered his head, people come in and go, whoa, which God is he praying to? Which spirit is it that's speaking through him? Okay, moving on. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head since it is the same as if her head were shaven. Now, the ESV says every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. And it is the same as if her head were shaven. I can't say for sure. We'll ask Paul when we get to heaven. Because it's possible that he was referring to wives. And here's the reason why. Shaving a head is a sign of dishonor. Because, fortunately, this is a little bit better than it was in the Jewish tradition. The Jewish tradition, if a wife committed adultery, she was stoned to death. And this time period, women who committed adultery were forced to shave their heads so everybody'd know. So, oftentimes, the covering was worn as, this is a married woman, and she's not available. Does everybody understand that? How many of you are married? You got a ring? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, got a ring? So, oh, every woman that prophesies without a ring. This is a cultural thing here. No. It's going to be dishonorable to my husband if I act like I'm single, whether it's in church or outside church. He's going to be mad either way, isn't it, Archie? (laughs) It's It's going to be dishonoring to our relationship if I act like I'm single and not married, whether it's in church or outside church. And so the tradition was that the woman as a sign that she is married or not available, would cover her head. So is that possible that what Paul was talking about? I think it's possible. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, he comes back then, and I'm running out of time. I can see that. He goes back in Ephesians, and he talks about one of the same things, and he talks about that. Well, let me just say this. I'm going to get off track here. Okay. Let's talk about, let's go back to the unity. He is talking about unity. He's talking about honor. You got that? Honor your head. Honor your head. Honor the elders. It's all about honor. It's all about honor. Okay. Before y'all freak out, let's, let's jump down to verse 16. You can read it all for yourself. It talks about men having long hair. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. This is how he concludes this discussion. In other words, all this has been much ado about nothing because he said, if anyone's inclined to be contentious, We have no such practices, nor has the church. We're not trying to enforce this upon you, but it's my opinion. If you have prostitutes coming in, women who have committed adultery, their heads are shaved. That says one thing. And so if you don't want to be that way, go ahead and women cover your heads and men don't do it. Now, where did he get that Jewish tradition? Because in Jewish tradition, men sometimes had their heads covered. It's changed over the years from one thing to another. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. I can go back and take you through the whole history. I'm not going to. Don't worry about it. I'll take you through the whole history. And men did, then men didn't. Some thought it was a dishonor to God. Some thought it was an honor to God. So... (laughs) 
This is specific, specifically cultural. So let's go back and grab some of these other ideas in here so we can conclude here in a minute. For if a wife or a woman will not cover her head, then let her cut her hair off. So he's saying, if you won't cover your head and you won't want to be identified with the Crips gang, are you following me here? No, they didn't really say that. If you don't want to be identified with a woman that commits adultery or a woman who says that she's available, mm -hmm. then just go for it. <laughs> Y'all are not following me here. All right. If she won't cover her head, she ought to just shave it. But it's disgraceful for a wife to cut her hair off or shave her head. Let her just cover her head. Let's stop this contention. What are we talking about? Unity. Let's don't cause contention in the church over this thing. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. It's a circle, right? It's a circle. So when God created, I don't have any place to write here. <laughs> God the creator, right? He created Adam. Adam. Mm -hmm. And then he said there was not a help meet for him. And so from Adam, he took he or the woman. <coughs> From Adam, he took Eve or the woman, and this is exactly what he's saying here. So who came first, the chicken or the egg? Who came first, Adam or Eve? Adam. But was Adam just a man? It's good. No, Eve was part of him. And then God extracted her. <laughs> 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 so man and woman are part of God's creation, the original creation. And who did God give dominion and authority to? Oh, I'm giving it to Adam and Eve. You'll have to take care of the flowers. No, he gave it to Adam. Adam, man and woman, when they were in one flesh. Does that remind you of anything? And the two shall become one Flesh. What is that? Marriage. Are we getting unity? Yes. God, I'm doing the best I can. I need some help here. God said, get this settled. Why? Because it's influencing where the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is today, the body of Christ, and what we can <laughs> accomplish. We cannot accomplish what we need to accomplish unless we are in agreement and unity. And we say, well, I don't believe like this Baptist, or I don't believe like this. I don't believe, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in every church, there are men and women, and they need to get together in unity and stop the fighting. Why do you think the devil attacks families? He wants to destroy the unity in God's creation and how God created us to work together in agreement in unity. And we can't allow, we cannot allow these misunderstood cultural things to keep the body of Christ from accomplishing what God wants to do on the earth. Amen. We cannot do it. Now what, again, we're talking about the head. The source of a river is its head, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what creates the river, right? 
Is God our creator? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have our source in him. Everything in this world mm -hmm. was created by him. And here's what the Spirit of God spoke to my spirit. He said, we cannot live independently of each other. Mm. And then I said, well, God, when he said, get this settled, I said, what is all this about? You're going to have to give me some help here. He said, it's about the impossibility to exist. Outside, separate. No, that's not. X that, delete. He said, it's about the impossibility. I'm glad when I learned to write this down. It's about the impossibility to exist separate from the creator. Mm -hmm. Woman cannot exist without man, cannot exist without Christ, cannot exist without God. Not in a stair mm -hmm. step. Yeah. One, two, three, four, but in a unity with God. Who is the, remember I said, who is the head of your household? It better be Christ. Yeah. It better be God. It's impossible. This is what, this is what God said to me. I wrote it down. The, it's about the impossibility to exist separate from the creator. It's about unity. Mm. And if the man and woman are in unity and in unity with the Spirit of God, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the creator of the universe, then, then if we are in unity, we can see the greater works. We can see the mighty manifestation of God. We can see these things. But this stuff has got to stop. The division that is caused simply by misunderstanding the culture of the times. That's good. So if women can't, if women can't, if, if, okay, if we ask <coughs> out her and she can't speak in the church, then what do we have? We have a great loss. Mm -hmm. We have a great loss. <clears throat> but we also have to recognize. You know, how many of you know that when when you get in strife, things go wrong? Mm -hmm. Things go wrong. Well, there's been a great deal of strife created here, and it's no different than one race saying to another race, you're not, we're, we're better than you. It's that stacking up thing. Mm. It's that stacking up thing vertically. It's a hierarchy. Who's at the top? And yet, God created all mm -hmm. humans from one man, Adam. I'll just say from Adam, because at that point he wasn't man. He was man and woman. Mm -hmm. Let you think on that a little bit. I discovered that. 45 years ago, as I was studying after a woman who was a scholar that wrote a word, uh, a book, God's Word to Woman, and she took it and she broke down the Hebrew. And Adam was man and woman. And God has characteristics of both. Otherwise, where do you think God yeah. got all of that? Okay, have y'all been shook up this morning? Yes. Are you shook up yet? Well, God says, get it settled. And I've always said things like this. Do you have somebody else that can do that? <laughs> <laughs> and I've quit saying, why me, Lord? <clears throat> because I've learned that, number one, not to argue with God, because I never win. <laughs> <laughs> and I really learned that, that uh, obeying God is um, is much better than arguing. And I know I, I don't think I got through with all this. Um, we can go down. Does nature itself teach you that a man wears long hair? It's a disgrace for him. What nature teaches that? I mean, I, I, does anybody get where that, um, that came from? Um, 
I know that was used a lot in the 70s when everybody, all the men grew their hair out and the guys had, you know, that was used a lot then. Um, but in that day and time, it was a disgrace because it was considered, a, you were considered a juvenile or a barbarian if you ha- if a man had long hair. So anyway, in conclusion, Paul says, if anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. And I'll conclude with Galatians 3, verse 28, that says, but in Christ there is neither male nor female. And let me just, one more thing. You never create unity by disrespecting the ones that have put you down. Okay? And that includes if it's racial, if it's whites and blacks, Hispanics. You never win. You never create unity. You never get what you want as long as you put down the oppressor because the whole point is, yes, maybe that person's been put down. Maybe women have been suppressed. Maybe. But we're not, we don't, we don't get what we want by putting men down. In the last few years, I've watched, you know, I don't even hardly watch TV anymore and the stuff that they put out. But over a period of years, they started taking sitcoms of families and made the man look stupid, ignorant, and a buffoon. And everybody laughed because it's just funny. It's just joking. But it's created a toxic, toxic situation Mm -hmm. and it shouldn't be because god created both and both are equal in his sight and that's what paul said there's neither male nor female bond nor free but all are one in christ jesus